So hi everyone, uh, thanks for who to join um, you know, this session live as well as the folks who will watch it later on YouTube. So uh, this is the multimodal weekly webinar series hosted by the team uh, at Tor Labs. Um, we've been meeting on a weekly basis every Friday over the past uh, 35, 36 weeks or so. Um, here are some of the topics that we tend to cover um, on a weekly basis, a news research in multimodal AI and production models. In innovative application of multimodal in different verticals. Um, since 12 apps, we focus a bit more on video, so sometimes we have people talk about their you know, related video related projects as well. And uh, oftentimes we have team members who give internal talks about source guys and using our platform APIs. In uh, some of the previous, uh, most recent session of our, of our series, we have, have a wide range of speakers ranging from um, you know, researchers working in fundamental uh, uh, AI, and, and video to uh, open source developers working on different part of the um, AI stack to you know startup founder who are actually building companies to tackle um, a certain problem you know, using you know uh, artificial intelligence. Um, in today's session, we have um, two speakers. Um, the first one is going to be Daniel Ferry, currently a senior developer advocate at uh, Webit, and uh, he will give a talk on um, the broad topic of multimodal AI. Um, you know, I, I came across his blog post on, um, you know, applying multimodal in TypeScript a while back and super excited to hear more about his process. And yeah, uh, Will Bay is definitely a, a, a good friend of, of 12 apps. I've been having like, um, you know, his, his coworker Zane in this session actually twice over the past year. And so definitely excited to see more, um, you know, uh, progress with, with, with the company and the product as well. In the second half of the session, we'll have uh, Timothy Dasset, currently a PhD student at INRIA and also working at Meta AI in France. He will be talk about his uh, research paper called Vision, Trans Vision Transformer Need Register. So I came across uh, Timothy uh, after uh, attending one of the, um, you know, uh, actually another web webinar session hosted by the team at uh, Cohir, uh, probably like three weeks ago or so. And uh, yeah, I think Vision Transformer is a very fundamental building blocks of you know, multimodal AI as it bridge the gap between, you know, um, uh, basically vision and, and in a traditional text format. So I uh, would love to kind of, uh, hear Timothy's insight on uh, some of the updates that he's been working on to help uh, improve the efficacy of, uh, you know, vision transformer. Um, so yeah, to share just some uh, quick logistical note. Um, if you have any question for the speakers, feel free to send them on the Zoom chat and I can surface them to the speaker, and we also have a short QA uh, after each speaker finish. So, with that, uh, I'll let um, stop sharing my screen and I'll let uh, Daniel get started. Yep. Let me get going. Thanks, James. Um, let me know if you can hear me clearly. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I have issues with my, with my audio interface. Right. It's been a while since I used Zoom. Give me a minute. No worries. Zoom actually doesn't have permissions to share my screen. But... Oh, I'm seeing it right now. Nope. I got it. I got it. All right. Perfect. Let's put our browser there. Yep. All right. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and apologies for the slowness in starting. Um, like James said, I am Daniel Piri from Weaviate and I'll be talking about multimodality um, and multimodal AI in general um, with a focus on TypeScript um, and also giving you some insight into the project that James saw that sort of prompted him to um, have me be on here. So um, again, thanks for letting me be on here. Um, we'll start here. Like I said, Daniel Piri, um, I do developer experience um, at Weaviate, and that's crafting what the developer experience for JavaScript developers looks like um, in building um, AI applications. And so if you're not familiar with uh, JavaScript or TypeScript, this will be a little bit new. 
and I'll leave some resources at the end so you can get into that. Right. Um, just before we start, I also want to agree on a couple of things. Um, the way I use multimodality here is um, to sort of reference interacting with or making use of multiple modalities in a specific scenario. Um, these modalities um, are usually modalities that we experience in our everyday life, like audio, video, um, text, um, and a lot of different um, others. So um, that's the first thing. Um, and then why I'm sharing this, um, I think in a lot of demos that I see, um, which is great because a lot of AI is driven by the strength of the Python community. Um, I am fairly passionate about the web as a platform and JavaScript slash TypeScript. So I think if um, we need to extend the impact that AI is having already, we need to be able to make it accessible um, for building it on the web, uh, building with it on the web rather. So um, that's that's really a lot of why I'm, I'm building these projects that I'm building and sharing on multimodality today. Right, so I, I do truly believe that we live in a multimodal world. Um, and by definition, I think I am a multimodal girl. I don't know if you get the reference, um, but the point is everyday life is uh, interacting with multiple modalities. It isn't just interacting with text, reading, um, or typing, um, we see things, we hear things, um, people hear us, people see us, people feel us. Um, it's a multi it's a multimodal world. Um, and so it's a bit bizarre um, that the beginning of a lot of our interactions which are with large language models um, was text only. Um, and I think the next evolution of that, and, and it's proving to be, um, as the next speaker will also speak, or also like get into, um, is multimodality. And so, um, I think it's really important that we extend this sort of like unimodal, unimodal interaction with large language models um, and expand it to accept multiple modalities. Um, because I think right now there's no denying you're on this um, platform, which means you're probably interested or already use um, artificial intelligence. Um, and so why not make it as easy as possible to actually use it um, for so these paradigms that humans are actually used to? Right. Um, so I want to also skip those slides. I want to focus on something that um, we use every day, something that's sort of like ubiquitous on the internet, um, which is search. Um, and this is where the first project that I'll be demoing sort of comes from. Everything we do on the internet starts with search. Um, and for a long time, a lot of our search has been keyword based, uh, which limits our interaction in this world that we agreed was multimodal, right? Um, if we want to search for someone's voice, for example, um, we can't really search Daniel's voice because it has no way, of, keywords have no way of sort of abstracting the meaning behind what my voice is actually like. Um, and so that's a big problem. When we do search things, or when we try and search things in this multimodal world, we sort of hit these roadblocks. Um, it doesn't really work, and and we we pretend it does, and we build all these abstractions, um, like adding metadata to different uh, media types, and trying to run keyword searches over that over the that metadata. Uh, but that doesn't particularly work, um, and this is exactly what it looks like. We're, we're limited to this like unimodal paradigm that isn't uh, at the core of how we interact with the world and how we interact with each other, um, and it's overall just a general uh, terrible experience. Because remember, we live in a multimodal world. So this is where vector search comes in. Um, you might not be familiar with vector search. It's got other names, semantic search. Um, and I'll just get into that uh, to show how that applies to this multimodal world and multimodal search that I'll be demoing in a bit. Um, and so when we type something like, uh, why do airplanes fly? This is a question um, which we we could type. We pass that into a machine learning model and we create vector embeddings for that. That then gets added into a vector space, and then we can sort of like um, we can we can get results. So the core part of this is we have to have a data store of uh, different modalities. This could be video. This could be text, um, and this could be I don't know audio voice notes, songs, something. Um, and when we put that in, into a sort of like um, unimodal uh, vector space, we aren't able to actually get these 
attributes, these sort of like rich media multimodal attributes, because uh, we only have a single modality in our space. And so the first step that we need to do or we need to make when sort of getting into this multimodal world is um, introducing multimodal embeddings. And so you have a couple of really interesting machine learning models um, like bind, like uh, like image bind or like clip, um, which are general purpose foundation models that help you sort of create these multimodal embeddings um, and you can embed your data. And that enables functionality like this. You could put in an image, you could put in a video, you could put in some audio, pass that into one of the models that I mentioned, like bind um, or clip and get your multimodal embeddings, embed them into your sort of vector space and then get back multimodal results also. Um, and so let's let's actually look at what what that looks like. I, I have an application built with with TypeScript here. Uh, it's this one. Let's go back. That's normal. Right. And so this is um, a multimodal search demo. Um, and in my sort of like database data store, I have images, I have videos, and I have audio. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm typing uh, a text keyword and then using vector search to search in my database and then sort of retrieve data of multiple modalities based off this keyword. And so what it is, it's translating words, plotting them into a vector space, and then sort of looking for what um, semantically makes the most sense and then returning that to us. And so um, something that I could search is groups of people. And so let's see what that returns. And so now we get groups of people. We get a video that actually has groups of people. Um, I could zoom in a bit if it isn't necessarily clear. Um, and we have a lot of images. Um, funny enough, it, um, it returns uh, lions because after the most probable responses or rather the closest responses for a vector search, um, it just shares the next thing that's closest also, uh, which is why um, hybrid search is also a really cool thing, which I will not be demoing, but we'll leave links to. Um, interestingly enough, we could search um, just to get a good idea of the actual semantic meaning that is captured here. I could search something like uh, chirping, which is the sound birds make, chirp. Um, and so because of that, um, uh, that sort of like embedding process and embedding those, that data and information into the database, uh, there's the understanding that a chirp is something that a bird makes. And so it makes the relation that it were probably looking for um, birds. And I don't know if you, I have audio streaming through here, but you should hear some chirping. Um, I have the videos um, and pictures of birds. I think I have something for lions also, um, or uh, bark, which should bring dog. Anyway, I think you get the, ooh. Anyway, um, so I think you get the idea. Um, single modality, we put in like our keyword and then we get, um, we get uh, multimodal responses. And this is a really interesting, use case, so sort of like this multimodal search. Um, and we can take it a step further, a demo something, and then talk a little bit more about what that is. Just give me a minute to shut down my Docker and bring up the next project. Um, and I mentioned Docker here because all this is running uh, locally. We get is open source, so you could either use it through uh, cloud services, or the, your local, um, like a Docker, Docker Compose file, spin it up, uh, and then you have a separate um, container for image bind, which is the machine learning model that um, sort of like enables this multimodal functionality. Uh, my next demo will be using a clip, uh, so that will be image only, um, but it will be a really interesting mix of like uh, multimodal search over images um, and text and uh, retrieval augmented generation. And I'll just show you what that code looks like. And uh, like I mentioned, the, the platform this is running on is Next.js. This is a web application. Um, and so I think it would make sense if I showed uh, what that looks like. So I'll just bring this up here and zoom in a little. 
it should be big enough. Um, right. So we have, if you're not familiar with Next.js, I'll focus on the parts that are uh, more important. And um, really most of the, um, I won't say magic, or most of the work is done with these lines of code. Uh, we of course import um, our wv8 client we have a typescript client um, and then define our sort of ports and uh, uro which is running on localhost like i mentioned um, we have like a typescript interface for our bind object um, and then at the bottom here we have a single function which searches the database and all of this um, these eight ish lines of code are what enable our, our multimodal search uh, and so we define a collection, which is by an example, uh, where do you have data in that collection? We just define this is the collection we want to retrieve data from. Uh, we define the fields that we want to search over. Um, in this case, that's media, uh, name, um, and then we get additional fields of certainty and ID. Um, certainty is just like how sure the model is um, or how close you are rather to the original um, query. Um, and then here we use near text search um, which is we create semantic search and then pass in the concept that is entered by the uh, the user. Uh, and then we can use some really traditional database um, lingo, like limiting uh, the number of responses that get back. Um, and then we basically pipe the, the data back into our web page where we then render uh, that. And so just like a really basic type in something, um, eight lines of code, retrieve data, and then just like that, you have multimodal search. Um, so yes, this is this is the the first one. This is the first application, uh, and like I mentioned, the second one will be talking a little bit more about um, retrieval augmented generation. Um, so let's get into that a bit. Um, yeah. So what does that have to do with JS? Like I showed, using the Weave8 client and about eight lines of code. Um, running with it locally on Docker, you have this really powerful uh, multimodal uh, search um, on the web. And of course, not to forget that we use the with uh, bind, bind module, image bind module to sort of like uh, embed that and deal with the multimodal search. Um, right, so we did look at code. Um, now let's look at retrieval augmented generation. Um, this is a term that's grown around quite a lot. Um, and for people not sort of privy to what it is, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's retrieval augmented generation. Um, so basically we run generation or an inference um, in large language models, um, but rather than just passing in direct context, we use search um, or rather sort of like filter our responses um, and then augment our prompt with the results of that sort of like filtration or search process, and then sort of like add that to the uh, the prompt that the large language model then sends. And I have a nice um, diagram to sort of illustrate what that looks like. And so we have our query, um, we sort of like embed that, put that into our database, and this is our retrieval process. Um, and so in our use case, the next application that I'll be sharing is a, um, sort of a demo application that helps you pick a, a movie to watch on a Friday, Saturday night, if that's something that you want to do. And so you put in your query, um, I'd like to watch a movie about pirates, for example. Um, it then takes that into your database, searches your movie database. Uh, in this case, I have movie posters, um, movie names, movie descriptions in my database. Um, and then it searches through all of that and, and then sort of gets that context, passes this um, and joins it with your query that you just put in as the context. So I want to watch, uh, so like sort of like show me what movie to watch um, out of these four movies. Um, and then it does do the filtration through the database using semantic search, which I just demoed, passes that into your query, um, into your sort of your prompt. Um, and that becomes, hey, out of these four movies that I just got from my vector database, um, which ones are the best ones to watch? Um, and then, like I mentioned, lastly, the generate portion is really just letting the LLM do its thing um, with that new context that you just passed. Uh, and then we get a response. So rather than just directly querying 
um, naively, I would say, um, we add some context that's relevant to our actual situation, given the data that we have, uh, and then pass that back to the, um, the user. So in a nutshell, this is retrieve augmented generation. Um, like I mentioned, retrieve, um, you get the user query, get the relevant context, and then augment it, add that to the prompt, um, and then let the LLM do its thing. Let's look at a let's look at a demo. I'll just start my application real quick. Um, and make sure my Docker file is running. Uh, the links to all of this, by the way, will be in the resources that I share um, later. So, okay. Docker's up and running. Just refresh. Oop. Right, so, excuse me. Flick picker, GPT, skip the hunt, find your background noise film for the perfect three hours after uh, work scroll session. Um, anyway. So uh, also this is a sneak peek. I'll actually be like sharing this. Um, I haven't shared, actually shared this. So the first ones to see this outside of the company. Um, I will go to desktop and I have a couple. Um, weird. Um, data sets, it's a, images. Um, so the idea basically is get an image um, and then sort of, um, I'll use the word vibe. Uh, the, uh, the LLM sort of, uh, rather the embedding model, um, gets the image and then passes that into um, a, an image search and then searches for images that sort of are similar um, to whatever image you take. And the idea is I could probably get my phone, take a picture of a random object, and based off that random object, I get recommended a movie to watch. Um, and I think it's a really interesting way to sort of like get inspiration, but rather... Uh, more than being useful, it sort of just shows the use case of something like um, a ve multimodal vector vector search. Um, I'll start with a random image that I've never actually used. I think this lizard is interesting. Um, and so we search our application and then we get these four movies. And so based off the lizard image that I just put up, I have these movie suggestions, um, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park Alien. Um, and then the really like interesting thing here is I could click flick pick it and based off these four movies, um, I sort of get an, I get good advice basically um, from the LLM on which one I should actually watch. Um, and so when I do that, um, the response here is, oh my God, you have to watch being John Malkovich. It's like totally mind blowing and weird and like so deep. Plus <laughs> um, John Cusack, so dreamy in it. Anyway, you see it. Um, and so I think that's that's really cool. That's really interesting. Um, I could do something else. I think I probably have looking for a specific image. Yeah, this image. Um, I think this is an interesting image. Someone in a dress probably had something like Comic Con cosplaying. Um, and then I get all these really interesting um, movie recommendations back. And I could flick pick it also. Um, and then it recommends watching. Um, eyes wide shut, um, which is that movie, and it sort of tells me something. Um, and all of this is stuff that you can tweak, and we'll get into the code of how this works. I think it's really, really interesting. This specific application is built with um, Nuxt.js um, and the clip model. And um, to sort of like reinforce the idea of multimodality, I just showed uploading images and then getting these movie posters, which I search over. I could do the same thing. Um, with, um, I could do the same thing with text. So I could say, show me movies about Africa. Let's say that. Because I see I have that Africa movie. Um, and so I have African Queen, The Horse Whisperer, Mary Poppins, Romeo and Juliet. Um, and as I did before, I could do Flick Picket. Um, now, based off whatever model you see right now, I'm using GPT-3. So um, I guess it's taste in movies isn't that great, um, but it um, it works. Uh, we have that retrieval augmented generation. And of course I could do like a normal, um, I know there's like Snow White or a Batman movie in here. And I could get that back also. 
Um, maybe Batman. Interested in seeing which Batman movie it recommends. Batman and Robin. Anyway, um, so that's the excuse me. That's the retrieval augmented generation. Um, in sort of like this flick picker application, um, and all of this is available on GitHub. Um, but more importantly, let's let's look at the the code that enables this application. So I will. I'll just like collapse this, collapse this portion. Um, the, sort of like the HTML template. Like I mentioned, this is built in Nuxt.js, which is a view framework. Um, and as usual, I sort of import my VV8 TypeScript client, um, initialize uh, my client here. It's using um, OpenAI um, for the generation um, as the LLM GPT 3.5 and I'm using my local VV8 um, uh, yeah local VV8 instance and I have a couple of functions here that do some really interesting things I have an image search and I have a, um, a text search and so in my text search um, I have my task here um, so this is sort of like the prompt that I say from my list of movies recommend one standout and tell me why you recommend it in a sarcastic teen tone um, and then like before, uh, you sort of define what collection you actually want to make this query from my name, the name of my collection is movie test bind. Um, and I use this with generate with generate, um, is the way we make generative queries out of the box, um, in, in wv And so then we using the open AI module generative module, I plug that prompt in and then, um, that's sort of like my rag workflow. Uh, and so I have the task that I defined there. Um, and I can limit uh, the responses to that by using grouped properties. Um, and so basically, of all the responses that I get from my search, which I do here is my text search, um, I only get the title response and then pass that to the LLM. Um, and in a scenario here, um, where I had a, an LLM uh, that was able to take multimodal inputs, I could essentially pass in my um, my media or my image or my video if that's something that I have stored. Usually we store the base 64 representation of images or videos or different types of media um, if I when actually rather than if um, very soon we will have a generative module that's able to sort of infer multimodal data outside of just like text. Um, and so there's definitely an update to this coming and then you can pass that in. Um, and and then have your query here or concept um, that then gets the user input, um, makes the query, then does the generation, and then you get um, you get the result that I just saw I just showed you in the demo rather. And then this is text search. Um, we also have image search here, and so rather than with near text, um, we have with near image, and this helps us pass in a base sixty four representation. Um, into VV8, and then we can run that search and get back the responses. And so all our responses, are, so basically we're searching using the image that we upload um, over vectorized images, um, titles, and descriptions. Um, and in these two functions um, are basically all of the functionality that I just showed and some um, some funky UI stuff just to make um, things load properly and and etc. And here, of course, we have like a helper function that converts the uploaded image to base sixty four format. Um, and so that's the sort of like multimodal retrieval augmented um, generation um, project. Let's uh, let's get back into it. Okay, right, um, skip this, of course, we already looked at, at code. And of course, like I mentioned, um, all of that was powered by um, by Weaviate, the AI native vector database. Um, if it's something that you haven't used, um, I have a couple of resources. If you're really interested in getting started with um, using Weaviate for multimodal search in TypeScript particularly, um, you can scan this or uh, go to the URL. I have a couple resources that I've put there. 
and you might find them uh, interesting. Um, and if you have any questions, um, it's also worth asking them. There's links to different platforms. Um, and also really important, uh, we've actually just launched the, the beta, our next uh, TypeScript client. Um, and so if you're really interested in building for the web, particularly with TypeScript, this is something that you definitely want to look at. Um, and like I mentioned, we, we do love multi multimodal data. So next week we, we do have um, an upcoming webinar on that. Um, you can have a look. I can share some of the resources uh, a little later. And we always have these really interesting office hours also. Um, if you want to talk to people about specific um, sort of like workflows, the use cases, um, modules, um, this is the perfect time. Um, so you can sort of scan this QR code. We'll talk about multimodality on the 6th of March. Um, and I think that should be it. Yeah, this is also a link to Reviate Cloud Services, but there's a link to that in the previous one. Uh, and that's it from me today. Hopefully I shed some light on uh, one, the importance of the web as a platform for building applications with artificial intelligence um, and maybe broke some barriers for a lot of people who feel that it's a platform that you can't build on. Um, I actively am as is seen in the demos and uh, I think the SDK and sort of like the the brevity of it all makes it really interesting and fun to to do all this building and hacking um, and basically if I can I feel like you probably could too at least I will try my best to make sure that you you can so um, that's it for me thank you very awesome. much I don't know if you have any questions awesome thanks Daniel um um, yeah, I think if you have any questions from audience, I think it, it would be nice if uh, they, they can ask them on, on a Zoom chat because, you know, we're running a little bit over. Uh, but um, but yeah, thanks for sharing the, the great resources. Um, super impressed with the two demos that you built. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people will be excited to try out the tutorials and replicate the code. And um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be sure to share the, some of the QR stuff that you put on um, on the Discord as well, um, so that people can learn more about you know using Webit and uh, try out some of the office hour and the webinar next week. Yeah, <clears throat> so yeah, reach yep. out if you'd like. And thanks again. Fantastic. Um, Timothy, do you wanna? Uh, I think it's your turn. You wanna get started with your presentation? Yeah, I'll yes. Hi. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Daniel, for the presentation. So hi, everyone. My name is Timothée Darcel. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the recent research paper we published with my advisors, Vision Transformers Need Registers. Now, it's going to be a bit different from the last talk. It's really a research paper. So it's uh, we're going to dive in in Vision Transformers, which are a type of model that are used to process the visual information, so images. And we're going to kind of do model debugging. Basically, we're going to dive in the model, find something weird, some kind of artifacts in there, and we're going to study them in order to propose a fix. Now, I'll try to go a little bit faster to just account for the time. So please excuse me if uh, I go a bit fast over some things. But so just as a preliminary, so that we have basically some uh, common uh, ground knowledge so that we're on the same page, vision transformers is just an architecture for vision. The same way convolutional networks are also a different type of neural network architecture. Um, vision transformers have a few advantages that are very simple and quite state of the art. Nowadays, a lot of state of the art are held by vision transformers. Another thing that um, is not really mentioned often, but is very important, is that they are transformers. And transformers is also the same way we process NLP. And it's also the same way we process quite a few modalities nowadays. And this kind of convergence of architectures is very interesting. A lot of researchers are quite excited about the, uh, the fact that transformers nowadays uh, can be used to process quite a few different modalities. Sorry. Um, and this might lead us to some convergence of the different, different modalities so that we can get, for example, a more unified uh, multimodal large language model. Now, Let's just detail a bit how vision transformers work. 
the idea is it's a transformer like uh, for NLP, but you have to feed the image into a transformer in a way. So you need a tokenizer. And this tokenizer for vision transformer, it's a patchifier. This is what we call a patchifier. It's just you cut the image into patches. Patches usually are 16 by 16 pixels with three channels. So it's uh, three times 16 like, times 16 pixel values. And just flatten all of these values into a single vector. You use a linear layer to project them, and you get vectors which are the tokens that are the input of the transformers. So that's the only thing for tokenizing. The other specificity of vision transformers is that we use a CLS token, that's a special kind of token that is added here to the input sequence of the transformer. And the CLS token is going to be responsible for gathering the information about the image and to output the classification, for example. Here you put the CLS token at the beginning and at the output, it's this token that you will take and that you will process to give your classification. Now, that's interesting because this CLS token, therefore, is the one responsible for classification, if I can uh, say it like this. Is the, yeah, sorry, just need to check the chat. Um, that's interesting because that means we can do something called an attention map. Now, what is an attention map? I need to detail that a bit um, because it's something we will study a lot. An attention map is basically a heat map of where the CLS token is looking in the image. Now, to understand what it is, it's actually quite simple. We just need to dive into one layer of the vision transformer, one self-attention layer. And basically, this is a self-attention layer. You got a few tokens at the input, the CLS token, and then the patch tokens. And they're going to be processed and take on a new value at the output. And this new value is just going to be a combination of the different values of the input, basically. You have this, all these connections. And now what you can do is you can look specifically at the connection between the CLS token and the patch tokens. These are what we call the attention scores. It's what the CLS token attends to. It's where it's looking, basically. And since it's looking at patch tokens, which correspond to specific positions in the image, you can re reshape these patch tokens into the image. Or you can do the same operation and reshape these values into a heat map. And this heat map is basically a heat map of where the CLS token is looking. That's really interesting. It means that the CS token, for example, for this image is looking especially at this top left part of the image, a bit top right, a bit here. So that means if uh, it was a classification network, that means it was the relevant part for classification. Now, this might seem uh, not that important, but it's actually extremely interesting because having this kind of heat maps, this kind of attribution map, is something a lot of researchers uh, look for. It's basically giving explainability to um, our network's behavior. We can see where the behavior of the CS token is coming from. And you have a lot of techniques to get that in uh, different uh, vision models to get this kind of attribution maps. So naturally, when vision transformers came out, a lot of people tried looking at this thing, looking at the attention maps and see what they look like. And the issue is they look like this. They kind of look, look like shit, honestly. There's this uh, weird shape that no one really understands why. Basically, you would expect that, for example, to classify this image as a cat, this model, uh, each column is a different model here, and each line is a different image. To classify this image as a cat, this model, you would imagine that the CLS token would be looking at the cat. Why not at all? The CLS token is looking at just a few patches, which are seemingly random and seemingly useless. It's just patches on the wall. You see, it's looking very precisely at this spot on the wall. It's weird. The even weirder thing is that there's a model called Dino, which came out afterwards, which has nice attention maps. And it was actually a very interesting thing in the original Dino paper, but no one knows why. Well, no one knows why Dino has nice attention maps and the other ones do not. And even weirder than that, when Dino V2 came out, well, I look at the attention maps and they are bad again. They're not like Dino. There are quite a few differences between Dino and Dino V2, so it's hard to say why, but still this whole behavior is very bizarre. No one understands what's going on. So today we'll try to understand a bit what's going on. And for that, we need to 
dig a bit into the model. So I'll just skip a bit a few initial tests that we do because they're not that important for gear, getting the gist of the, the presentation. But for example, we can uh, look at something, which is where do these tokens appear? These outliers, these, uh, these artifacts, where do they appear? We've seen creatively in these two images and in a few others that they seem to appear in background areas, like the wall, the sky here, kind of appear in low information areas of the image. Now we can quantify that and by measuring the similarity of the patch on which they appear to the neighboring patches. And what we observe is that there's a lot of similarity, actually. It's, if we quantify that by the cosine similarity of the patch to the neighbors, we can plot the distribution here and see that for normal patches, it's kind of spread out. Basically, you have a lot of different possible values, but the artifact patches in orange, they appear exclusively, almost exclusively, on patches which are perfectly similar to their neighbor, which are almost exactly the same. So what does this mean? It means that the artifacts appear almost only on uh, region of the image, which are uh, redundant to their neighbors, which have no additional information compared to the neighbors. Now, we could think that uh, this means that the model is looking for a place where it can discard the information that is contained in this patch. But let's test this hypothesis and actually measure what information is heard inside those tokens. And we can measure, for example, the information that is supposed to be there, the information of the patch, so the pixel information and the position information. These two types of information are in the token at the beginning of the vision transformer, so they should be in the token at the output uh, too. So we can try to uh, train a linear probe to recover the, this information. Basically, we try to see how much of the position information is contained in this token. And when we compare this amount of information for the normal tokens versus for the outlier tokens, these artifacts that we observed, sorry, we see that the normal tokens have much more position information than the artifacts. The artifacts kind of uh, discarded or forgot this information of position. And it's the same thing for reconstruction. Reconstruction is just the pixel information. Can we recover the pixel values given the token embedding? And what we observe is that the artifacts have much less pixel information. They have much more error than the normal patches. So if I sum up this table a bit, it's just the model seems to have discarded the position and pixel information that was contained in these patches. Now it's weird, it's a very weird behavior. It's not natural for the model to discard information, especially since it could be useful information for the classification. So the natural question to ask is, what other type of information could it have stored there? And our answer is the model stored global information in those tokens. Now we're, what we mean by global information in this case is classification information, basically. We do the same um, protocol, linear probing, to assess the amount of classification information that is in the artifacts tokens versus the normal tokens. And we compare that with the CLS token, which is basically a top line for this. It's uh, because it's the token that is supposed to hold the global information. So this is basically the, the highest value that we could hope from a, a token. And what we observe is that although the outlier tokens do not have as much more information, as much global information as the CLS tokens usually, they still have much more than the normal patches. The value is above for ImageNet places, as you can see, but some of the data sets, uh, it's a huge gap. Here you can see 17 versus 79, here 18 versus 84, 10, 85. There's a big difference in the amount of information that is contained between the normal patches and the outlier patches. So, these are quite a few different uh, things that we observed, but they kind of fit together. If we fit all of this together, we can formulate this hypothesis. Large sufficiently trained models, I didn't show you why, but this behavior only appears on large and sufficiently trained models, learn to recognize redundant tokens. 
that's what we saw the tokens that have nothing more compared to their neighbors and use them as places to store, process, and retrieve global information. Basically, the model just forgot what was in this patch and then used it as a kind of scratch pad. Just store some information, process it, retrieve it afterwards. It's a very surprising behavior. It's not something we expected. Um, and of course, it's still a hypothesis. We, we have some empirical data to, to back it up, but uh, it's a hypothesis. But it's a hypothesis we feel is quite reasonable to, uh, to make with the data we have. At least reasonable enough to try and design a fix, try and fix this behavior. Because the, the fix here appears pretty natural. As I said, these tokens uh, were being repurposed to be kind of scratch pad for the model. I can write some stuff. Well, if I want the model to not do that, I should just give it a scratch pad, give it some tokens in which it can write if it wants to. And this is what we call registers. Registers are just a few additional tokens that you put in the model and the model can do whatever it wants with it. It's just a, it's a token that has no uh, specific input value that brings no additional information to the model. And uh, the output is not used. It's not used for the loss, for example. You just use your CLS token or your patch tokens as, you, as usual. But the thing is, during the transformer layers, the model can learn to attend to the registers to gather, to gather information. Um, sorry. The model can learn to attend to the patches from the registers, to transfer information towards the registers, to write into them, can process information in them and then can learn to read this information from the registers into the CLS token, for example, for the loss. And even though this might seem far-fetched to expect the model to do that, this is exactly what happens. When we add registers, it fixes the attention maps completely. Just this is a model trained without registers, and you can see the usual weird shape of the attention map with these outliers. When we add one register, the attention map is completely nice. You have none of this behavior anymore because this scratch pad behavior was transferred from these weird patches into the registers. Now we verify that on a, on a few different um, training paradigms, uh, supervised, tech supervised, and self-supervised. Um, Dynov2 is a pretty uh, strong self-supervised uh, training paradigm. Clip is for tech supervised, and Day3 is uh, a SOTA uh, supervised testification uh, method. And basically what we see is that when we add registers, this is here I'm showing basically the distribution of the norms of the patch token. So I skipped a bit that to go faster, but basically these outliers, these, these uh, tokens that have a very high norm, these are the artifacts. And the fact that we have none of those outliers means that we have fixed the attention maps. And it's the case for the three models. So this fix, these registers, it works in all three paradigms that we tried. So it's pretty robust, pretty uh, uh, universal fix. So that's quite nice. We can um, afterwards ask a few other questions. For example, how many registers do you want to add to your model? What we see is that there's not a huge difference between one register or more registers. Uh, at least for the attention maps, one register is enough. More does not change them really. But adding a few more registers can improve the scores. Uh, for example, here, here we report the downstream uh, scores on a few different uh, tasks, even net classification. And when we add registers, the uh, accuracy improves. So here, the, the gap is not huge. You should check the y-axis. We are talking about, about 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's not a huge gap, but it's signif significant enough in SSL. It's something we, we like. Um, segmentation, it improves. Depth estimation, this is lower is better. It improves too. We see that there's a shape that is a bit different for segmentation and depth estimation here. There seems to be kind of a, an optimum. This optimum we, we think is around four and four is quite a nice number because it's still a low number of registers which does not change too much uh, stuff about the optimization of the model, the training process, uh, the flops. So we like four. I mean, if you want to know what I use in my daily experiments, just I always put four, uh, just uh, easy enough. So 
good enough, we both fix the attention maps and we improve the scores. So it's quite nice. And that's basically it. I mean, there's a bit of a bonus. That's just a, an interesting behavior that we observe, but we haven't studied too much. So I can't say uh, perfectly I understand this. It's just a, a small bonus. During this whole talk, we have uh, looked at attention maps of the CLS token. And now, as you can see, when we input this image, the attention map is nice for the CLS token. It's, it's not noisy as it was before. But what we can imagine is looking at the attention map of the registers that we just added. And when we do that, in some cases, different registers attend to different parts of the image. The register zero attends to a bit everything. The register six attends to the sugar cube, this one to the spoon, this one to the coffee. You see there's, there's kind of a separation behavior where each register chooses one object and attends specifically to this one. It might seem a bit, um, a bit uh, yeah, a curiosity, but it's actually very interesting from a research perspective. I mean, you need to understand that there's, for example, this paper, it's called Slot Attention, where uh, people try to introduce very specific mechanism to force the vision transformer to do exactly that. And it's quite interesting that here, we never forced or even encouraged the vision transformer to do that. And still it did by itself. It's just an emerging property in a way. So it's very interesting. It's it does not happen very often in deep learning that the internal representations of the model are structured in a way that is humanly understandable. Here it's structured by objects. It's quite interesting. So yeah, that's all for this curiosity. But if, if I just want to sum up the talk, this is what it looks like without registers. With registers, you can see a quite drastic improvement in the quality of the attention maps uh, for both uh, supervised, text supervised, self supervised training on a few images. The attention maps looks really nice now. It's quite uh, interpretable, if I may say. You can see that if you want to know why the model said this was a bird, well, this is the part of the more of the image that is actually relevant to the model. So yeah, thanks uh, everyone for your attention. That's all for me. But if we, of course, if you have any question, uh, I can take them now. We have three minutes. <laughs> That's no mm -hmm. good enough. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's this one, right? Um, yeah, like, uh, if the audience have any questions, feel free to just put in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, I think, like, uh, yeah, my, I, my... I have a question. Oh, go, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, is the, the concept of sort of measuring the attention of the, um, image transformer, I don't know if I got the word right, only for classification or is it useful for generation also? Well, so it's only for vision transformers. So you have some vision transformer for generation. It's not, I mean, it's becoming more and more common to have transformers for generation, but uh, uh, I think m most uh, generative models are often uh, using CNNs like QNET. But for generation, if you have a vision transformer, yeah, you could look at attention maps. The issue is which attention map do you want to look at? Because basically the idea is that at each layer, each of the to patch tokens, so each of these little squares is going to attend to the whole image. So for example, I could like choose this token that is under my mouth and uh, look at the attention map from this token and I would see that probably it's uh, attending to around itself and maybe the object. So you can look at a lot of different attention maps. It's uh, still an interesting thing to look at, but um, this thing of looking at the attention map from the CLS token to the image, uh, it's only if you have a CLS token. So then I don't think, uh, yeah, different transformers don't have a CLS token if I remember correctly. I don't think a lot of them have equivalent tokens. Okay, really interesting. Do you know if the same concept is applicable for um, image masks? So sort of like having a mask and then generating around, could you use this attention map to focus on a specific part of an image without having a mask and then generating outside of that? So like it, it does recognize that it's a bird, for example, in that last image. Uh, and so if you're, you would use this for generation and say generate like a starry sky um, in the background, um, so I mean, be... I guess you could pipeline different models together, like use this model to identify the bird 
and cut it out and uh, use uh, another model to generate the background and uh, paste it back. <laughs> I guess that's not a very satisfying way to do that. But technically um, possible, right? Yeah, I guess it could be. It's, it could be a, a way among others of generating a segmentation of the object, basically. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah, thanks for the answers. It's a really interesting um, no presentation thing. Thanks. Perfect. Um, it sounds like the main, the main like improvement that you have with this with this work is um, identify identify that drawback of the original vision transformer, right? And then uh, you know by adding this register concept, you have improved its performance across different tasks right here. And so, like I think one implication I, I would assume is just like. Um, like with this change, you know, future model that leverage vision just from backbone can also have better performance, right? Uh, on on the specific task. Hopefully, yeah. Um, the improvement in performance is not. I mean, so I've tested it on a few different um, uh, trainings. On Dino V two, there's a significant improvement, not huge but significant. On um, on other models, it's uh, the conclusion is more mixed. Uh, it does not always improve. It always improves the attention maps, but the performance does not always improve. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and uh, related to this concept of attention maps, what, what do you think is like the the biggest benefit of having like you know uh, more representative attention maps from from uh, vision transformer? So advantage in practice. So as I said, there's explainability. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, basically if you have an image of a dog and a model class phase it as dog, but the attention map looks like this, it gives you no information about what was important to the model, whereas this is much more informative. Something I didn't talk about is um, the fact that these artifacts are not only in the attention maps, but also in the feature maps. In the Like if you plot the feature map of uh, the output features of a vision transformer, for this image, they look like this. You have these huge artifacts here, which are very visible. And um, that's, I mean, the model still works for classification, for example, but if you want to reuse the feature map for downstream tasks, such as segmentation mm -hmm. or depth estimation, if you want to make a model that would be usable for multiple downstream tasks, then having a good feature map is very useful. And, uh, this is what it looks like after the uh, addition of registers, it's much better. In mm -hmm. Dynovit, that's really what we're aiming for, uh, of making a model that we train with a global loss, but that we can reuse in a lot of different uh, tasks uh, downstream. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent part of part, like using feature map for for downstream tasks. You know, they did detection, segmentation, uh, you know, uh, classification, etc. Um, yeah, I can see like a lot of opportunities to like leverage them and then you know fine tune it on the specific task given a much more powerful vision maps. Um yeah I, I think that's we went a little, a little bit over time but um I think uh that's the that's a great way to conclude our, our webinar. Thanks team for for the uh, walkthrough of your you know the history of vision transformer and, and your research work. Um yeah the webinar will be um the recording of the session will be available at some point, probably in the next two weeks or so, and I'll be sure to share that with the attendees. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Daniel. Thanks, team, for making the time to uh, sharing your work with the audience today. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I'll be sure to include all the relevant resources that you guys provided in the final recording so that folks can check out and learn more and uh, yeah, check out both, both the uh, tutorials that Daniel showed as well, read the papers that Tim did been building. Um, yeah, that's that's it from my end, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. Um, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day.